Trinitas, we are finally going to begin our new sermon series through First and Second Samuel, and it's aptly termed Your Kingdom Come. These books in Scripture are all about kings and kingdoms, some of the greatest literature of all time. Surely, even on the level of pure secular literary criticism, you can see that these books have characters with great depths and complexity, perhaps greater than any other book in Scripture. But what of this matter of the kingdom? What is a kingdom? Friends, we're going to have to tackle a concept, a problem of philosophy today to really appreciate the value of this book. And we're going to begin just before 1 Samuel at the end of Judges. There we encounter in one verse what philosophers have called the problem of the one and the many. The question of how multiple people can be part of one entity in a way that doesn't do violence to them. The question of how you can have a group, a society, a family, a nation that is rich and inspiring and powerful, again, without depleting individual freedoms in what we are in ourselves. It's actually one of the most practical and most difficult problems you can encounter. And therefore, before we go to the word and read it, we're going to ask the living God to give us understanding together. We just did a corporate confession of sin, friends. Points us to the fact that we are one church, one body. It also points us to the fact that we are inclined to suppress the truth of God rather than to ingest it and embrace it. So let's pray that the living God would allow his word to sink into our souls. Bow your heads with me. Mighty God, how resistant we are to the truth. In fact, we're even resistant to that statement, despite the fact that it is so obvious of us in so many ways. God, we ask that you would remove our defenses, remove from us every tendency to wander, remove from us every disdain that we have in this place for our neighbor. Lord, remove from us the distractions of this life that in the reading of your word and in hearing it, we may be one body with many members, with harmony and peace between us, most of all peace with you, a readiness to respect you as our head. We ask this, Father, in the name of your son, Jesus, and by your Holy Spirit, amen. If you've got your Bibles, we are just gonna read one verse today. It's Judges 21, verse 25. Just one verse. And when I'm finished reading, I'll say this is God's word. You can respond, thanks be to God. We'll rise to our feet and sing a short verse together, the glory of Patri. Judges 21, 25. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. This is God's word. Trinitas, the problem of the one and the many, or rather, hold on, I was just about to go at it, but we're going to let the uh, little kids go, four to six-year-olds, and be part of the kids' catechism class. They know what to do. They will gather with uh, Jeremy Swingle there and uh, another representative in just a moment. They're going to go learn the catechism that we will confess before the end of the service. But Trinitas Church, the problem of the one and the many is not a mere problem of philosophy. It's one of the most practical problems problems that confronts you perhaps every single day. It's one of the biggest problems of your entire life. In short, it is the question, how can many things be a harmonious one? How can one group do justice to the freedoms and the unique pursuits and personalities of the individuals? And the thing about this problem is there is absolutely no escaping it. Individuals cannot exist without groups, families, and societies. And just as obviously, families, societies can't exist without individuals. It's obvious. If you think of yourself as a lone ranger, a pure individual, you're so dead wrong in your self-conception. You came into existence by a union of two people, and you came into this world as the third member of a family. You're already part of a group, part of something bigger than yourself. Even if you hate society, 
and you want to disown your family, disown your nation, curse society and leave and go live in the wilderness. To even issue a curse, you've got to use their language to do it, rendering it totally obvious that you're part of that language group, people in society. It's really incredible when people have this idea, I'm gonna spurn the whole, spurn the group, go off on my own. People say these things like, I've had it. I'm headed into the wilderness. Have you ever seen the movie Into the Wild? I really like that one. (laughs) People are like, I've had it. I'm going out, I'm gonna go rough it. And I'm taking my REI sleeping bag and my mountain hardware fleece pants and maybe my iPhone, but that's it. You're still part of the whole. Same thing is true of groups. No matter how lame and self-destructive the members of a band may be, the rock band can't exist without them. The group needs them. If Dan Reynolds, lead singer of Imagine Dragons, got rid of all the other members, it would just be Imagine Dragon. If Dan himself left the band, then it would maybe just be Imagine You can't have a group without members. I will note that part of this problem is that it's often difficult to say when things are better as a whole or when things are better when left as individuals. I was confronted with this problem in a surprising way in my youth. There's this occasion when the three Bosserman children, that's me, my big brother, and my younger sister, were one year apart, went to my grandmother's house and she made us some quiche to eat. And it was one of these occasions where we had an infamous grandma smackdown. We didn't like the quiche. Not one of us did. We might have nibbled on it a little bit and um, set our forks aside. Grandma comes in, notices that no one's eating anything. And this is how her indictment went. And I don't know why I was the target of this. But she looked at me and she said, well, you like cheese, don't you? I said, well, as a matter of fact, you're right. I, I do like cheese. She said, well, you like eggs, don't you? <laughs> you got me again. I, I do like eggs. She proceeded to list all of the ingredients in this quiche, and I was amazed to discover that somehow I liked every one of the ingredients, and yet, when put together as a whole, yum plus yum plus yum equaled yuck. <laughs> it's a fascinating reality. In this case, the one really perverted the many in my conception. They're all good separately, and I might have eaten them alone. Had I been more clever at the time, I would have come back to Grandma and said, well, Grandma, you like spaghetti, don't you? You like chili, don't you? You like ice cream sundaes, don't you? Well, then why don't you like spaghetti, chili, ice cream sundaes? The answer is because putting things together doesn't always make something better. The same is true in the opposite direction. I was horrified when I first discovered that Caesar dressing has something called anchovy paste in it. I didn't think it possible that I liked anything with anchovies. And then when you think about it, anchovy paste plus minced garlic plus lemon juice, all things I would never eat on their own, yuck plus yuck, plus yuck, somehow made my favorite salad dressing. It's incredible. Sometimes things, when put into a group or a whole, are made better. How many of you think perhaps Russell Wilson was maybe never that great of a quarterback, but the magic was in Pete Carroll's system? Huh? I think a lot of people think that now. Many ladies tonight may encounter the problem of the one in the many in their cooking. Yes, they might. It's all comedic and something to laugh about when we're talking about quiche and omelets. The very worst thing that might happen is you might suffer some violence to your taste buds. But friends, it's a bona fide crisis when you're talking about human society. How the whole can exist without doing violence to the one, how our personal freedoms can exist without doing violence to one another and the whole that we form. And it's no laughing matter. And society goes like this. You can see the benefits of having a strong society, a strong nation, a strong whole. But to have that, we all know you must do some violence to individual freedoms. Call it taxation. 
Maybe mandatory military service. Maybe law enforcement of things that you don't think of as crimes. At its worst, it would involve imposed vocations. Society needs more nurses. You, 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 and you. You're all nurses. That's what's going to happen, says the government. There's no doubt about it. When you have a strong society, a strong whole, wonderful and inspiring things get produced. Who can deny that Egypt's pyramids are inspiring? All the product of slave labor. (laughs) Who can deny that New York subways are something remarkable? Product of slave labor as well. Moreover, when it, one, when a nation gets too strong, it actually begins to become weak. Would the U.S. be stronger, for example, if Bill Gates had been told in his youth that he has to be a mailman, Musk that he has to be a police officer, and Miley Cyrus a computer programmer? Would we be better off? Seems unlikely. And so people know that there must be some honor and respect for people's individuality that sometimes takes precedent over the whole. Individual freedom to create art, to invent new tools, to be oneself, to pursue happiness. The thought is that if the many are enabled to embrace their freedom and their way of life, they will voluntarily offer themselves in defense of the state. However, at the same time, freedom is also a problem. I doubt that most of you believe that what Jeffrey Dahmer and Charles Manson needed was more freedom to be themselves. It doesn't strike as the solution to unshackle them. (laughs) Just the same, it's interesting that when the Civil War took place and the South was embracing kind of a states' rights perspective, um, Jefferson, Jefferson Davis, the president of the Confederacy, had to frankly tell all the states, listen, unless you let me institute a draft and force young men into military service, we're going to lose this war. (laughs) Problem was, that was kind of the whole point of the war, is that the federal government couldn't do stuff like that. Individual freedom can be a weakness. One of the problems with the one and the many is that um, there's no order that makes every individual happy. It's a fact. Turns out in 2022, only 38% of Americans describe themselves as satisfied with U.S. government policy. (laughs) That's a third. Two-thirds dissatisfied. This makes for a cynicism in people. Maybe there is nothing like perfect harmony to even be pursued. Maybe we have to resign to the fact that it's just going to be frustrating and violent to be human. You can't live with your neighbor. You can't live without him. That is, in fact, the cynicism that so many embrace. If it doesn't strike you as practical enough, yet families in this room, you understand this problem oh so well. Moms and dads, how many of you have ever said this? Why is it that whenever the whole family is together in one room, all we do is fight? Why can't we be a harmonious one? Teens? especially young adults, how many of you have said, I just don't feel like me when I'm with this family? I feel more like me when I'm with my friends. I suspect we've all thought things like this before. Moms and kids might be saying, Dad, we need stronger leadership from you. Dad might be saying, I actually need greater responsiveness from you when I try to lead. This is not a theoretical problem. It is an all-encompassing problem in human life. Even just a problem with your friends. Young men, you might say, man, I really really love Buck and Biff when we play on the football team. I hate these guys as roommates. When we're in this system, we're great. When we're expressing our own individuality, (laughs) I can't stand the people who I thought were my best friends. What I want to tell you from the very get-go here is that um, there's only one solution to the one and the many problem. And that one solution is the triune God, the trinity of Christianity. See, in this passage, it says in Judges 21, 25, in those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. In fact, this exact statement is said in so many ways at least three other times in the book of Judges. It's descriptive of chaos Everyone doing what is right in their own eyes is societal chaos. It is a nation that is weak with no agreement about how to live and what sorts of boundaries should exist between us. 
How many feel like that is increasingly the way it is in the United States? At the very same time, uh, when it says there is no king, it means there was no unity in society. There was no rallying point of authority. And I want to impress an important point on, on you all. Many of you might read this and think, the big problem Israel had is that they didn't have a political king or sovereign. That is not what this passage is saying. This worldly perspective, it is insidious and dangerous that we need some strong central leadership, a political king, a mighty man to unite us all. And I'll bet many in this room sometimes think this about America. If we just elect the right darn president, it'll solve everything. Friends, it can't be what this passage means because God was the one who said they couldn't have a king at this time. They couldn't have a political sovereign at this time. What this passage means is that Israel has neglected God as her king. Only God is qualified to solve this problem of how we can be one and many together. And there is a reason why he is so qualified. It is because he is the Trinity. He has existed forever as the closest, most intimate, most profound unity. The divine nature being not even divisible into parts or degrees, but all three persons being all that God is and yet distinct. You know that feeling you even get with your best friends? I could use a break from these people. The Trinity exists in eternal unity where they have never had a break from the purest, closest, mutually indwelling unity. They've never been broken. Who else can tell us how to hold our families and our churches and our society together? If you don't believe that the Trinity is absolutely authoritative and effective in producing a unity that is real between a multiplicity of people, I would lay upon you this proof. Only his kingdom, the church, is 2,000 years old among human societies and has outlived every single nation on planet Earth. Only his church has continued to be one over and above all nations that rise and fall. Not only is the Trinity the only authority who can instruct us in these matters, friends, only the Trinity can give you hope that what lies ahead for us is more beautiful, powerful, and inspiring unity between individuals that draws out the best of us rather than tramples us for eternity. Only he could tell you that. Trinitas Church, I would have you know that for us as Christian people, the Trinity, God himself, is our heaven. We will enter into an eternal face-to-face -face fellowship with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit that will sustain us as one in perfect unity, drawing out and even glorifying us as we glorify God for eternity. That is our end and goal. You might paraphrase, therefore, Judges 21, 25 this way. In those days, the Trinity was exiled from Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes and longed for a human tyrant. Today, we have essentially a one-point sermon there's only one route to harmony in your home, in our church, and in society, and that is by tending to God as king, making the Trinity our point of worship. We have to spend the Lord's Day calling on his promises in prayer, celebrating our hope in song, partaking of his body and blood. And the world will say that's insane, but we will say that is the preservative to all harmony in every society. The only other option uh, to treating God as our king, our rallying point of unity, is to turn to human wisdom, which will provide for you contradictory answers about how we should be one, and it will offer temporary and deceptive results. And so I'm gonna actually uh, describe three ways, three ways to excuse yourself for doing whatever you want and chasing after false unity, tyrannical kings, 
That way you can search your own heart and ask yourself if you are prone to these excuses. Just three excuses. It's appropriate. We're talking about the Trinity. This is the anti-Trinity. First excuse um, to do what Israel did, which is whatever you want, and uh, to not settle for anything less than a tyrant king, is to, to envy sinners. In the book of Judges, what transpires is that Israel is getting pounded by her neighbors. The reason for this pounding goes back to the fact that they quit worshiping their God, but they don't accept that answer. What we have in Judges, therefore, is in succession. Mesopotamia in the far east pounces on Israel. Moab in the southeast to the nation, just next door, pounces Israel. Syria in the north pounces Israel. Midian in the south, Ammon in the east, and Philistia in the southwest, all in succession, just beat this nation down. Again and again, God, by his grace, raises up a judge an especially gifted warlord, but frankly, it often seems too late. The people have suffered much before then. This gets the people of Israel thinking, what is it that these nations have that we don't have? And the conspicuous answer for them is, they've got a king, a strong central government, and we don't. And this inspires two thoughts in the people. Until we get a king like the nations get, we're off the hook. We're doing whatever we want. God set us up for failure. Forget it. God better give us a king, they say, because this is what a king can do with a royal family. We could react quickly when attacked. We could unify our tribes and have a standing army at all times. He could build a fortress palace and a fortress city. If we had all that, that would deter our national enemies from attacking us in the first place. And so again, Lord, until you give us that, we're going to eat, drink, and be merry. And we're going to look over our shoulder for someone ready to be our political leader at all times. This is called sinner envy. We're all prone to it. Wanting worldly strength, wanting worldly salvation. It's as if this people Israel forgot that they first of all conquered their land by supernatural warfare, not by human might. The walls of Jericho fell at a shout. At Gibeon, God destroyed Israel's enemies with hailstones and lengthened the day and caused the sun to stand still in the sky. I wonder if you guys realize the same is true about America. You might look at America and say, this nation was conquered by our military might or got its independence by its military might. I will tell you that no matter what your history books say, that is absolutely wrong. This country exists because literally for a century, people died in England and Scotland and the Netherlands and France to worship their God according to the scriptures. That is why this country exists and the Lord God sent people of that mind to this land, and you'd be badly mistaken if this country began with the conquest of the sword. You know, the problem when we go looking for worldly might, a tyrant to unify us and make us strong like an iron fist is this. If we are not practiced in honoring God as our king first, any political king that arises from us is going to be a tyrant who submits to no law above himself. What a frightening leader that makes for. I might even ask you, friends, what would be worse than getting pounded perpetually by godless tyrants and political enemies? What would be worse than that? I'll tell you what would be worse. For us to become a godless tyrant. That is the worst It's worse than being attacked by one. And the sad story that you're going to see in Samuel is that Israel's first king will become a tyrant who unifies the nation around his tyranny, who rules with an iron fist and does not submit to God. So I simply have a warning for you. Do you look at the world and say, they have friends, they have families, they have strength, And their gifts and their creativity and their individuality shines. I just want you to know it's all a lie. 
Did Tom Brady and Giselle Brady look like they had a perfect marriage three years ago, and they both shined with their talents before the whole world to see? It was false and fleeting. Did Will Smith look like he was a talented actor and had lots of friends before 2022? It's gone, disappeared. In the same way, you could have asked, did the Philistine kingdom, the Roman Empire, and the British Empire look strong like it would reign for centuries, millennia? They're no longer with us in that form. The second excuse to do whatever you want and to chase after kings goes like this. You look to your left and you look at your right and you say, my neighbors aren't doing their part, so I'm not going to do mine until we get a mighty leader to show up and to unify us. I am off the hook until we get some mighty sovereign to create unity with these lazy neighbors of mine. See, Israel was a mess not only from without but from within. No tribe had done their part to drive out the Canaanite inhabitants as God solemnly charged them to do. And these inhabitants were given to perversion, degradation, and violence. And the thought of every tribe is very clear. If they're not going to do their part, what's the point in me trying to do mine? And again, God, you set us up to fail. If only we had a king who could make my neighbor do his duty. I'll have you know that God's law never says, thou shall not steal, asterisk, unless your neighbor does. The Bible never says, thou shall not steal, asterisk, if and only if there's a king who punishes evildoers and thieves. It is a grave danger for you to say, I need a political king to get me to obey the sovereign of the universe. In fact, the divine king is more powerful to actually bless your obedience to his law with neighbors who do the same. You cannot change your neighbor's heart. But we have reason to believe that if we are following our living God, he will bless our obedience with brothers and sisters who are given to the same. We experience this in church all the time. I'll tell you about an early Trinitas experience when we were extremely small. It's no one who goes to church here and no one that probably most of you remember. But a man walked in and there might have been been 10 people in church. He walked in as if disgusted and said to me, no one is here. Where is everybody? Service was about to start. I had to resist every temptation in my soul to say, well, He must be at the same place you've been at the last four Sundays since you weren't here. (laughs) Same place. Where were you? The gist of his comment was clear. I want this place, this church, to be well attended and entirely independent of whether I'm here or not. I want to be nice, neat, and here. And I'm kind of ticked off. It's ruining my worship experience when I can't show up to a place with a lot of people And when I don't have the freedom to not show up whenever I want. That's the worship experience I'm looking for. Like, you know, a lot of benefit, zero put in. (laughs) I want there to be rich unity and community here, and I want to be entirely inessential to that rich unity and community. And there's more to it. There's more to it implicitly. There was also, and by the way, I want you, pastor, to be the sort of person who can make that happen. What's your problem? Why can't you do that? Even more, there was this gist that, and by the way, if I can't have all that, as I've already shown you, I'm probably just not going to come at all. And to this day, this person doesn't go to church anywhere. See, the logic goes like this. The reason I've frequently absented myself is because it's uncomfortable to worship when so many people are absent. Now think about that. How do you get out of that circle? I've got a warning for you, friends. Our fellowship will only be as strong as um, the commitment of individuals to determine to worship the king of the universe rhythmically. No mere man can make you do that. And if a mere man is making you do that, then there is something hollow about your worship. 
If you need a celebrity king, a celebrity worship leader to make sure there's always a big crowd, otherwise you just aren't sure you can make it. You're not worshiping Jesus, friends. You're worshiping something else. There's a two-verse proverb that contradicts this entire mentality. Ecclesiastes 9, 14 to 15 says, There was a small city with a few men in it, and a great king came to it, surrounded it, and constructed large siege works against it. But there was found in it a poor wise man, and he delivered the city by his wisdom, yet no one remembered that poor man. Do you know what this is saying? An individual who serves God faithfully and wisely can actually be more powerful than the mightiest worldly king. This is a picture for worship, friends. The church of Jesus Christ has not been sustained for 2,000 years because at all times there was always a grand charismatic leader at the helm of it. It's rather because there have been countless individuals who worshiped God faithfully and gave a strength to the whole, gave a strength to the many that it would seem to lack by human observation. And yet it is true, not one person remembers their names. This is what the Bible teaches about serving the great king in small numbers and when your neighbor is not doing the same. I would simply challenge you to understand If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you will be called on to serve him with a sacrifice that is often not matched by your neighbor. Often not matched by everyone in the same measure and degree. Well, the third excuse to do whatever you want and to chase after kings and tyrants is to succumb to this line of reasoning. At least... I'm doing better than my neighbor. At least I'm more righteous than the person to my left. We can justify all sorts of sin and insanity and self-service in doing whatever we want so long as we feel ourselves to be slightly above the average bar of our neighbor. This is clear in the case of Israel in the book of Judges. See, the entire tribe of Dan apostatized. They quit worshiping Yahweh at his tabernacle, and they started worshiping idols. They actually left the land allotted to them, went up to the far north of the kingdom, and there they had their own religious system. You can see how the people would say, surely with a sense of moral superiority, look, we just worship Yahweh and other gods from time to time. As bad as Dan, they quit. We're worshiping Yahweh, and then when we're looking to have a good time, we go worship um, at the pagan festivals. They're actually a lot more fun than Yahweh worship. So, but, but we still worship him. You can imagine the people saying, and by the way, we're off the hook for doing that until we get a king who can handle people like Dan. Yeah, we want a king who pounds the really bad Israelites. Go get him. Go get him. But we also want a king who has a little bit of room for idols, just Just a little bit. Reasonable. After all, he's got to be the king of this nation, and not everyone here is a total Bible thumper. So, if we had a king like that, we'd be unified and strong. This reasoning is alive and well among Christians. I'll tell you, when I am doing marriage counseling, um, one of the most common phenomena, it, it goes like this. There's the phrase, isn't it normal? And now put, put your sin there. <laughs> Pastor, isn't it normal for husbands and wives to be like ships passing in the night? Doesn't, doesn't that just happen? Isn't it typical for married couples to neglect romance and intimacy? But don't most wives have trouble submitting to their husbands? Don't most husbands drink a little bit too much from time to time? I doubt other families actually read the Bible daily and pray together and much less sing praises to God. I mean, maybe once a month, maybe just at church. And there's this longing for me to provide a gauge of the health of one's marriage other than God's word. Longing for a pastor king who kicks out adulterers but who winks at lesser aberrations from what God has called us to. 
This is an excellent way to justify doing whatever you want, an excellent way to justify celebrating authorities who are simply a magnification of you and is frighteningly dangerous. All of this is wrong-headed. Friends, uh, the conclusion of this introduction is that 1 Samuel will vividly um, offend all of these sentiments I just described. Vividly, you'll see the horror that results when you go looking for unity in your marriages, in your churches, in your society that is gathered around anything at all but worshipful obedience to God. God is going to give Israel the king she wants, and frankly, many of us want. Saul, at his worst, he does not usher in peace and harmony between the one and the many. Um, He becomes a tyrant and ushers in even greater chaos. It's frightening. God is also going to reveal, however, a different sort of king. Israel's second king is going to be a foretaste of Jesus Christ himself. It will be King David. And at his best, David is a man who makes the whole group better. But he looks a lot more like a suffering servant than he looks like the sort of mighty and glorious king that we often seek after. David makes the many better, not by force, not by compromise, but by leading the nation in service and worship of God. And at his best, he is a genuine foretaste of our Lord and Savior. But this points us at the end of our reflection to the king who we came here to worship today. Jesus is a different kind of king. He is a king He is a point of unity for the church, like the head of a body who dies for every member of that body, who lives the perfect life of obedience to the Father that we have all neglected to live. By this one man, the many who believe in him will have eternal life and fellowship with the triune God. That is the good news of the gospel. We do hope you would receive Jesus as your Savior today. The good news is not only that we have a great mighty king who can represent us as better than we are in ourselves, is that he also pours out his Holy Spirit to make every single member of his body the more like unto himself. This spirit of God, the third person of the Trinity, is more mighty than our sin. He enables every member of Christ's body to lay down their lives in service to the king. And that's actually what we're doing right now. Not only that, but he makes us shine like utterly unique jewels. He imparts and draws out strengths from us that we did not even know we had, and he will do it for eternity. He'll never be done. This God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, is the solution to the one many problem. And his church, with Jesus Christ as king, is the only community that is strong enough to exist until the end of time. Let's bow our heads. Mighty God, we think too little of you. We sometimes think of the gospel as as this thing that really comes into play at the final judgment or the end of time. It's this thing that um, is irrelevant until the very end how wrongheaded this idea is. We pray, Lord God, that we would celebrate the gospel, that we would tend to you as king, that we would worship you with gladness and joy as we seek to have wholeness in our relationships, in ourselves, in our communities, even in this secular society. May we really be like a preservative in the earth as you called us, the salt of the earth, because there's real life in your church. There's real peace. Lord, I pray that not one of us will be downcast in burden as we look to our left and our right in this land where so few believe in you and trust in you and follow you. I pray that such would never become an excuse for us living God to treat you as anything less than what you are, the holy, sovereign, holy, satisfying utterly dependable Savior that you are. Pray these things, Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, and by your Holy Spirit. Amen. Trinitas Church, at this time, we are going to take an offering.
This is one of the ways that we worship the living God, we acknowledge that everything we have belongs to him. It's one of the ways that we lay down our lives as a living sacrifice. Let's worship together. By God alone, I am safe from my sin. To God alone be glory, amen. By God alone, I am safe from my sin. To God alone be glory, amen. The word of God is truth revealed for man to know God's law. The standard of reality, the Bible guides in all. There is no other book divine, no other sacred tome. The truth of God lies nowhere else but in his word alone. Salvation is a gift of God, so may no human boast. By grace alone have saints been saved and blessed to uttermost. No, nothing else can save my soul, my sin that can atone. The sinner now redeemed by God is saved by grace alone. By God alone, I am saved from my sin. To God alone be glory, amen. By God alone, I am saved from my sin. To God alone. of natural man cannot appease the wrath of God through Christian faith the Savior saves and stays the Father's rod for God could not my sin forgive through merits of my own the guilty wretch is justified by God through faith When first the sin of man appeared, the Lord withdrew his hand. Thus Christ became a man and died to bridge the awful span. No other one could mediate between me and God's throne. The wayward son restored to God finds hope in Christ alone. By God alone, I'm saved from my sin. To God alone be glory, amen. By God alone, I'm saved from my sin. To God. Glorify his name. Let all creation with one voice his wondrous deeds proclaim. Who else deserves the Lord the praise? It is not flesh and bone. May all of life fair glorify our King, our God. Amen, Trinitas Church. I heard that amen over there. Yeah. Amen. You know, we're, we're called Trinitas Presbyterian Church. If you don't know what that means, uh, Trinitas is just the Latin word for Trinity. Um, 
Trinity is a rather common name for a church, and we wanted something slightly different, um, a little bit of individuality. Um, but, but what that calls to is the God that we serve. Um, we're called Presbyterian because it's a form of government, church government, where we're not just a lone individual church or entity. We have a presbytery. We have a unity that transcends this church right here with other congregations. These are conscious, conscious determinations that we have to be this sort of church. There's much to celebrate in it. In fact, what we're about to do is go to the Lord's table where Christ says, this is my body and blood. And it's not hard to catch the image of this sacrament that we are partaking as if becoming incorporated into Christ's body and incorporating Christ into us the more. That's what this is all about. And this sacrament is more powerful than you probably give it credit for. It's not just a mechanism to remember something. It's actually a means of grace, something by which God himself is more powerfully imparting a unity to us and a life to us and holding us together. And this meal has been eaten every single Lord's Day for 2,000 years. And it will be eaten every single Lord's Day until the end of time. Let's bow our heads in prayer and ask the Lord to meet us here. Living God, you are so profound, so awesome in all that you are, especially as you are the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We are just smitten by the grandeur of Christ's high priestly prayers. He went to the cross and prayed that we may be one as he is with you, Father, in the Holy Spirit. Fascinating. We pray for that prayer of Jesus Christ to be filled somewhat the more today as we come to the Lord's table, not just receiving mere bread and wine, but coming in faith and asking for all of the promises attached to it. Make us more like our Savior. May we have a richer unity with him and with one another, we pray in Jesus' mighty name and by your Holy Spirit. Amen.